Hello everyone, today I'd like to talk about Harry Potter. Now, I could do the standard video essay introduction for Harry Potter, you know, it's a series of books, a series of films, video games, a stage play, a whole bunch of merchandise and all that, but we all know who Harry Potter is, right? It'd be better if I started by explaining why I want to talk about Harry Potter today, and there's a few reasons. Firstly, there was recently another round of discussion about J.K. Rowling's Goblins. In recent years, there's a few different types of discourse relating to Harry Potter that come and go on social media. People talk about Rowling's Goblins being possibly similar to anti-Semitic stereotypes, uh, people talk about the problematic natural slave race who like their slavery, uh, the queer baiting with characters who are stated by Rowling to be gay but never explicitly depicted as gay, her attempts to retroactively add more diversity to the Harry Potter world than she initially depicted, and a whole host of other topics. This drive to re-examine and criticise Harry Potter is undoubtedly fueled to some extent by the actions of the author in recent years. J.K. Rowling is a committed and very vocal opponent of trans rights, and, well, I'm not going to rehash all that here. There are several videos on YouTube which thoroughly cover J.K. Rowling's transphobia, and I'll link some of those below. But for our purposes today, all we need to know is that J.K. Rowling's statements on trans rights have put her at odds with a lot of people who previously enjoyed her work. And people naturally want to work that out, right? How could a children's book author who wrote such a beloved series go on to be such a bigot? Perhaps the signs were there all along. Now, whenever it comes time to re-examine the Harry Potter series, I confess I feel very left out. I read the first three, maybe four books as a young lad, but then I guess I got too old for them. Or maybe they just got too long, she rarely got away from the editors at some point. Those later books can be a real slog. But still, I wanted to know how fair are these criticisms of Harry Potter? Do they hold water? Now, it wouldn't be exactly fair for me to start offering opinions having not read the books, so I went and read the Harry Potter books, I watched the movies, I watched the Fantastic Beasts movies, which were rubbish and weird, uh, I read a whole bunch of Pottermore articles, the short stories from Hogwarts, the script of the stage play, I even read the casual vacancy and a few bits here and there of Rowling's detective series. What all this means is I am now a certified Harry Potter expert, and I can get involved in the discourse entirely guilt-free. So I'm going to do my own Harry Potter discourse retrospective today. There's a lot to talk about, and I think it's only fitting that we begin at the beginning. So at the beginning of the first Harry Potter novel, The Philosopher's Stone, we are introduced to Harry's aunt and uncle, the Dursleys, and we follow his uncle Vernon Dursley as he goes about his day, noticing various magical folk celebrating the apparent demise of series antagonist Lord Voldemort. Now what do we learn about Vernon Dursley in the opening chapters of the first Harry Potter book? Well, he's quick to anger, he is narrow-minded, he dislikes anything out of the ordinary or improper, and he's bigoted towards people he sees as being different from himself. He's a conservative, basically. He and his wife are Rowling's liberal skewering of typical conservatives. She even has Vernon reading the Daily Mail in a later book. Vernon is verbally and physically abusive to Harry, because Harry is a little magical lad, and Vernon hates magic. He wants the magical and non-magical worlds to stay far apart, and he's willing to go to extremes to keep them that way. We're also introduced to Harry's cousin Dudley, who is a spoiled bully who is also abusive to Harry. Dudley is going to a fancy private school, Smeltings, whereas Harry is going to Stonewall High, the local comprehensive, which Dudley implies is rough and full of bullies. Now, do I think it was intentional that Rowling called the scary school for paws that Harry is worried about attending Stonewall? Probably not, uh, but it is funny now. Now, Harry's first contact with the Wizarding World, once he's older than a baby, that is, is Hagrid, who turns up to deliver Harry's invitation to attend Hogwarts. Now, as he's introduced to us here, Hagrid is, in many regards, exactly the same as Vernon Dursley. Now, if any Harry Potter fans are listening, I'm sure you just raised an eyebrow at me comparing lovable old Hagrid to Harry's uncle Vernon, but if we examine their actions and their beliefs, they are in many ways a mirror of each other. 
Hagrid is quick to anger. He threatens Vernon physically after he insults Albus Dumbledore. Hagrid is physically abusive. He uses magic to disfigure a child because he's having an argument with his father. He gives Dudley a pig's tail which has to be removed with surgery. Hagrid doesn't like people who are different from him. Muggles. He uses the word muggle not just as a descriptor, but as an insult. It means mundane, dull, and unspecial. Hagrid wants the magical and non-magical worlds to stay far apart, and he's willing to support extremes to keep it that way. When Harry asks why the Ministry of Magic works to keep the existence of magic a secret, Hagrid responds, Blimey, Harry, every one of you wanting magic solutions to their problems. No, we're best left alone. One of Hagrid's functions in his introduction to Harry here is to serve as comeuppance for the Dursleys, to give them a taste of their own medicine. Hagrid and his magic are divine retribution. Dudley likes to bully people, so he gets bullied by Hagrid. Dudley was going to a fancier school than Harry, now Harry is going to a fancier school than him. Vernon likes to other those different to him, and so he gets othered by Hagrid, made into a muggle. Now, while it might be satisfying from the audience's perspective to watch Dudley, who they know is a bully, be treated the way he treats others, uh, from Hagrid's perspective, he's just disfiguring a child he just met, you know? A similar scene happens in the fourth book, when Fred and George Weasley poison Dudley with a sweet that makes his tongue grow to be a foot long. And then the next chapter opens with Harry and the Weasleys all laughing at Dudley. Now, this is strange. Firstly, the Weasley twins have never met Dudley before, so they poison him off second-hand information, basically. Uh, but also it's strange because Rowling forgets to have Dudley do anything bad in the opening of the fourth book. He doesn't do anything to Harry or anyone else. Rowling's just coasting off his previous bad behaviour in the earlier books. Well, actually... I tell a lie, Dudley does do one thing that J.K. Rowling considers to be very bad and worthy of punishment, and that is be overweight. Just in Goblet of Fire, for instance, we're treated to descriptions of Dudley being as big as a young killer whale, being wider than he is tall, too fat to hide behind his parents, we hear about his porky hands, his piggy eyes, his massive backside, and the comic relief of the opening chapters is that Dudley is struggling to stay on a diet. Harry even mocks him about this before sneaking off to eat some cakes that he's concealed. This is all why it's funny that Dudley later eats a poisoned sweet, I suppose. This is one of the things that really jumped out at me reading the Harry Potter books, just how much time is devoted early on in each story to making fun of Dudley for being overweight. Rowling just really seems to have it in for fat people, and she gets worse in the casual vacancy published after the Harry Potter books when one unsympathetic character is introduced in the following way. He was an extravagantly obese man of 64. A great apron of stomach fell so far down in front of his thighs that most people thought instantly of his penis when they first clapped eyes on him, wondering when he had last seen it, how he washed it, how he managed to perform any of the acts for which a penis is designed. Now I think it's very telling that Rowling would write that most people think things like this when, well, I can only speak for myself here, but if I see an obese guy, I don't immediately start thinking about him washing his penis. But J.K. Rowling does, so we know that now. Rowling has defended her presentation of fat characters by pointing to characters like Molly Weasley, who is overweight, but this is rubbish, honestly. There's a big difference between presenting a disgusting, fat character greedily stuffing their piggy face like Dudley, and presenting a jolly, plump character, which is what Molly is. Molly is described as plump. One of the things I much preferred about the way the movies tell the Harry Potter story is that they cut out a lot of the general meanness and cruelty that exist in the books. Rowling doesn't just mock overweight characters. If a character's supposed to be unsympathetic in the books, the gloves come off with regards to physical descriptions. For instance, consider the Slytherin girl who, quote, reminded Harry of a picture he'd seen in Holidays with Hags. She was large and square, and her heavy jaw jutted aggressively. Reporter Rita Skeeter also has hair that contrasts oddly with her heavy-jawed face, and we elsewhere hear about her large, mannish hands. Vernon's sister Marge is, quote, large, beefy, purple-faced, and even had a moustache. 
If a character is supposed to be bad, then Rowling usually presents them as being physically ugly, and for women, the way she makes them ugly is to make them large and masculine, and if this all sounds misogynistic, it's because it is. Even beyond physical descriptions, the characters themselves, even Harry and his friends, have a real mean streak in the books that was largely excised in the movies. And let's look at one example of this. There's a scene in The Order of the Phoenix where the evil Dolores Umbridge fires the Hogwarts divination teacher, Professor Trelawney, and tries to have her evicted from the school. This scene is depicted rather differently in the book than in the movie. In the movie, Trelawney is more of a sympathetic figure. She's supposed to come across as helpless and frail, someone who it would be especially cruel to bully, to highlight just how awful Umbridge is being. In this scene in the books, Trelawney is ranting, drunk, and waving a sherry bottle around her head, because in the books, she's an alcoholic, because that's funny, isn't it? Alcoholism. The movie has Harry and Hermione looking on all sad at this obvious injustice, whereas in the books, they don't really care. They don't like Trelawney. Hermione even outright states, I don't care if she throws out Trelawney, but she's not taking Hagrid. The movies take the approach that while Trelawney might be annoying and a bit of a fraud, she isn't evil, she isn't a bad person, she doesn't actually deserve to be humiliated, she's still part of Hogwarts, right? The movies understand that the audience will still have sympathy for her if she's treated unfairly, even if she happens to be annoying. In the books, however, Trelawney mostly just pops up whenever J.K. Rowling wants to make fun of alcoholism. Rowling does not expect the audience to have sympathy for Trelawney. She's annoying and a bit of a fraud, so it's open season to be as cruel as you like. Movie Hermione looks like she's about to cry when she sees Trelawney get fired. Book Hermione could watch Professor Trelawney be slowly beaten to death by a bludger, and she wouldn't feel a single thing. Anyway, let's move on by asking a question. Uh, is it wrong, in the Harry Potter series, to make fun of someone for being overweight? Now, the obvious answer, you might think, is no, because Harry makes fun of Dudley for being overweight, Hagrid makes fun of Dudley for being overweight, the narration makes fun of Dudley for being overweight, and this is all played for laughs. It's not presented as the same type of bullying as Dudley's bullying. It's not considered deserving of retribution. However, we also see both Draco Malfoy and Vernon Dursley make fun of Molly Weasley for being overweight, something which outrages Harry and his friends. It's understood that it's wrong to make fun of Molly for being overweight. When Draco insults Molly's weight, it isn't played for laughs, it's used to illustrate how rude and insulting Draco is. So is it wrong to make fun of someone for being overweight? And the answer is, it depends on if you're a good or a bad person, and whether your target is a good or a bad person. But whether you're a good or a bad person is totally divorced from whether or not you mock people for their weight. Now this is just one example, obviously, but this disconnect is typical for most actions in the Harry Potter stories. What is done isn't so important compared to who is doing it. Outside of extreme examples like murdering a bunch of people, there aren't really good or bad actions in the Harry Potter universe. There are only good and bad teams. Sometimes literal good and bad teams. Characters are assigned good or bad as labels, and whether their actions are considered good or bad follows from that. As another example, we could ask, is owning slaves wrong, as it's presented to us in the Harry Potter stories? Which again, we have to answer with, it depends. Are you a good slave owner, or a bad slave owner? Now, just to head off a potential criticism here, you might say, Sean, what are you expecting here, morality-wise, from the children's book series written for little babies? Aren't you taking this a little bit too seriously? And the answer to that is that I don't really like the assumption that stories are unable to be criticised because they're for children. After all, you can have stories for children that are executed very well, and stories for children that are executed very poorly. Also, while the first stories are written for little babies, uh, the later Harry Potter novels are intended for increasingly older audiences. Rowling tried to increase the target reading age of the novels along with the main characters, and she did this in a few ways. Firstly, the novels get more complicated, they get much longer, much longer than they have to be, I'd add. Uh, they get much more violent, miners start getting killed, that's miners with an O, not like miners. Uh, beloved characters like Sirius and Dumbledore start getting murdered, 
Spoiler warning. Uh, the main character's cute pet owl gets murdered, and then it explodes. It's rough. The stories also get more sexualized as the characters age through their teens and start experiencing all of those teenage hormones, and it also gets increasingly political. In the early novels, politics is something that children occasionally glimpse adults doing, but it's largely above their ability to influence, because they're 12. Later, however, the politics of the Wizarding World become a key component of the stories. The Ministry of Magic becomes an important setting, the Minister of Magic an important character, the actual non-Wizarding Prime Minister is a point of view character in Book 6. So how does this aging up and complicating of the series relate to the presentation of good and evil? Well, when the series starts, things are very simplistic. Basically all evil in the Wizarding World stems from Voldemort. If someone is bad, it's because they're a follower of Voldemort, or the child of a follower of Voldemort. Everyone in Slytherin is bad because they're the bad team. Things are very black and white. Now, despite attempting to mature other aspects of the series, Rowling never gets away from this overly simplistic presentation of morality. She makes a few attempts, but they prove to be false starts. She always ends up right back here in the first novel, where all evil stems from Voldemort, who murders people because he's bad. And it makes for rather frustrating reading. Rowling frequently threatens to make the series more interesting, introducing several ideas that seem very much like setups for a later payoff, but then that payoff just never comes. As an example here, let's talk about the fountain in the main hall of the Ministry of Magic. This is introduced in the Order of the Phoenix and described as follows. Halfway down the hall was a fountain. A group of golden statues larger than life-size stood in the middle of a circular pool. Tallest of them all was a noble-looking wizard with his wand pointing straight up in the air. Grouped around him were a beautiful witch, a centaur, a goblin, and a house elf. The last three were all looking adoringly up at the witch and wizard. Now if you get wizard supremacist vibes from this statue, you're supposed to. This is all a conscious reference to real-world statues that give off white supremacist, colonialist vibes, featuring usually white men in positions of power, lording over their presumed inferiors. So in this statue, you've got a wizard holding up his wand, the symbol of his power, above the lesser races who are forbidden by the Ministry of Magic to use wands themselves. That's an idea introduced in Book 4. The house elves are a slave race, the centaurs are classified as beasts and restricted to particular territories, even the goblins who run the wizard banking system don't have equal rights. This statue is important later on, as it's the site of the duel between Dumbledore and Voldemort. The statues either get destroyed or are brought to life to participate in the duel, and Voldemort ends up standing on the statue's plinth. And this is the site of the reveal of Voldemort's return to wider wizarding society, right? So this is a very simple metaphor, you would think. This statue is a literal monument to the hypocrisies and inequalities in the wizarding world. And it's here that Voldemort is revealed to the world because it's from this inequality and hypocrisy that he draws his power. It turns out that not all evil in the world stems from Voldemort, quite the opposite in fact. Voldemort's authoritarian violence and desire for control is merely an extension of the systems that already exist in the world. The Ministry has no argument against Voldemort on an ethical level. The wizards own slaves, they run a torture prison, they deny equal rights to non-wizards. There are actually repeated worries in the novels that Voldemort will draw various races of creatures to his side, specifically because he might be able to offer them a better life than what the wizard supremacist ministry is currently imposing upon them. We even learn later that Voldemort was able to literally get away with a murder he committed by framing a house elf, something he knew would not be investigated due to discrimination against house elves. So the systemic inequalities and discrimination in the wizarding world enforced by the Ministry of Magic are providing both the opportunity and ideological groundwork for Voldemort to rise to power. Crucially, Voldemort's ideal world isn't fundamentally different to the one currently enforced by the Ministry. He just wants to extend the persecution to also include muggles and non-pureblood wizards. He wants to discriminate against certain humans, like the wizards as a whole already discriminate against the other races. This is seen when Voldemort gets to redecorate the Ministry in the last novel, and he puts his own statue in place which has a witch and a wizard sitting on a throne of muggles. And lest you think I'm reading into these statues too much, Dumbledore explicitly states after his duel with Voldemort, The fountain we destroyed tonight told a lie. 
We wizards have mistreated and abused our fellows for too long, and we are now reaping our reward. Now, having set all of this up, you might expect Rowling to then do something with it. You know, go on to tell a story in which the various systemic problems in the wizarding world are resolved, or at least addressed in some way. After the addition of all of these elements, the story can't simply be about defeating Voldemort anymore. Defeating Voldemort at this point should mean defeating his supremacist ideology, which by necessity means defeating the supremacist ideology inherent to the wider wizarding world. Merely defeating Voldemort in a contest of power can't be a satisfying ending anymore, because after how horrible the status quo has been made to seem, simply beating Voldemort in a fight and then returning to the status quo must be seen as a failure. Anyway, spoiler alert, none of this gets resolved, Voldemort's defeated despite it all, and the final sentence of the novels is, all was well. All is well, but yes, we are keeping the slaves. We're the good guys. So you might be asking, why put in all of these elements if they're not going to be utilised? You know, why attempt to complicate your story beyond a simplistic tale of good versus evil if you're just going to unceremoniously drop all that to write an ending that contradicts it all? You know, what is J.K. Rowling doing? One of Rowling's flaws as a writer relates to her not planning ahead, not just with the politics and morality of the series, but with everything. She often introduces elements to her world with apparently no thought as to the later consequences, and for a very fun example of this, and let's talk about time turners. So time turners are little portable time machines that enable the user to go back in time. They're introduced in The Prisoner of Azkaban, and Harry and Hermione use one at the climax of the story to save and free Buckbeak the Hippogriff and Harry's godfather Sirius Black. Which, you know, is fine in and of itself. However, the potential problem with introducing time travel to your fantasy series is that your fantasy series has time travel in it now, so going forward you have to account for the fact that characters can travel through time to resolve problems. Otherwise, any time anything unfortunate happens, everyone will be asking why the characters aren't using their time machine to fix it. One way to do this is to make time travel difficult to accomplish somehow, so thinking ahead you impose limits on the way the time travel mechanism can be used. So you have a time machine that only works in certain circumstances, or requires a certain object or fuel to function. Or the Discworld novel Nightwatch, for instance, features time travel as the result of a magical accident, so it's not easily repeatable going forward. Rowling's time machines, on the other hand, are small, easily portable, apparently infinitely usable and they're introduced because one is handed out to a 13 year old so she can do extra homework. And you know what, if they were just used as a comedic bit, that's fine. You could say they only work on trivial things, like Hermione can take extra classes at wizard school, say, but you couldn't use them to save a life or anything dramatic like that. But then the time turner is used in the conclusion of the story to save Sirius and Buckbeak, so now you've got an indeterminate amount of these little time machines in your stories that have no limits on their use, they can apparently do anything, and they're handing them out to actual children. Now, the next novel in the series, The Goblet of Fire, features the death at the end of the book of beloved character Cedric Diggory. I'm assuming he was beloved. Somebody probably loved him. So anyway, Cedric dies, and readers at the time probably wondered, what happened to all of those time machines, right? Just give one of those a twist and prevent Cedric from dying. But there is no mention of time turners in the Goblet of Fire, it's like Rowling just forgot about them. And you know what, I'm not even going to criticise that necessarily. Rowling thought of one story with time machines in it, and then she didn't want to deal with them anymore, so she didn't. And if she left it there, I'd actually kind of respect that, that's what the movies did after all. Because ultimately, it doesn't really matter, does it? It's not a fatal flaw if your fun fantasy series isn't that coherently planned out. These aren't killer criticisms. If Rowling just never addressed the time turners again, most of her audience wouldn't care too much. Cinema sins would ding it. You'd maybe have a few YouTube videos or BuzzFeed articles called, like, The Dark Side of Harry Potter, Why Didn't the Wizards Use a Time Machine to Stop Hitler, or whatever. But again, that's just for fun, criticism. It wouldn't really matter. Why didn't the Eagles fly the ring into Mount Doom? Because they didn't. You know, whatever. Plus, setting your story in a magic school gives you very generous space for literal a wizard did it plot hole explanations, right? It would be very easy for Rowling to say, 
time turners can't undo the killing curse, or whatever. If you use a time machine to save someone who gets killing cursed, they just die anyway, so it would be pointless to save Cedric. There you go, simple explanation based on magical rules of which she is the master, so there'd be no way to argue with that. The problem is J.K. Rowling can't leave well enough alone when it comes to the time turners, and she did a series of very strange and funny things. Now the first funny thing she did was, in book 5, the one after Cedric dies, in a move that feels very much like a response to people asking about the time turners, she destroys all of the time turners. So Neville Longbottom is fighting a Death Eater in the Ministry of Magic, and they accidentally destroy a cabinet, which has all of the time turners in it. All of them. They're all just on the same shelf, and then they all get knocked over, and they're gone. That's unfortunate, isn't it? And <laughs> I love this. This is the clumsiest, literally the clumsiest, most lazy way of getting time travel out of your story. You know, sorry everyone, Neville knocked time travel over, so we can't do that anymore. It's brilliant. Now, the next funny thing she did, again, in a move that feels very much like a response to people asking about Cedric Diggory, is show us just how horrible the world would be if Cedric Diggory survived. So Harry Potter and the Cursed Child is a stage play which is based on a story written by Rowling. In that play, Harry Potter's son goes back in time using a time-turner in order to save the life of Cedric Diggory, and he saves Cedric's life by making him lose the Triwizard Tournament, meaning he doesn't touch the pork key at the end and so isn't present at the end of the Goblet of Fire for Voldemort to order his death. And as a result of losing the Triwizard Tournament, Cedric is so embarrassed that he becomes a Death Eater. <laughs> really? And he fights on Voldemort's side in the Battle of Hogwarts. Uh, he kills Neville Longbottom, which ensures that Voldemort wins, who then goes on to be the dictator of the Wizarding World. Now this is amazing. It's like, it's a wonderful life, but in reverse. You know, look how awful it would be if you survived, Cedric. Cedric Diggory. It's a horrible life. That's what they should have called it. And what this all means is when Dumbledore eulogizes Cedric in the Goblet of Fire, you know, he was a good and loyal friend, a hard worker, he valued fair play, he was good and kind and brave. No, sorry Dumbledore, he wasn't. He was actually only one bad day away from becoming a fascist murderer, and it's good he died. Jesus Christ. You see, it isn't so much that Rowling doesn't plan ahead that is the problem here, it's her later attempts to go back and fill plot holes that really damages the story. I actually have my own theory about what happened with the Time Turners, and it's called the One Book Lag Theory. It's something I noticed with a few other elements in the Harry Potter novels. What happens is Rowling will introduce some element to a story that seems like a big deal, and that you would expect to still exist in the next novel, only it doesn't, it just vanishes. And this may have led to readers inquiring as to where it went. So then, in the next novel, as a reaction to criticism of the missing element, Rowling will knock it off the shelf, so to speak. So we get time travel introduced in book 3, it vanishes for book 4, then falls off the shelf in book 5. And there's another of these in the second book, The Chamber of Secrets. In that novel, the poverty of the Weasley family is a repeated theme. We see the Weasley children wondering how their parents are going to pay for all of their school things. Uh, the Weasley boys get hand-me-downs, but the parents need to buy all new things for their daughter Ginny. Uh, there's a heartbreaking scene where we see Molly Weasley reaching into the corners of her bank vault looking for more coins. And through all this, Harry feels embarrassed and guilty because not only are the Weasley family keeping him as a guest, he's rich. He's got a huge pile of gold that his parents left for him. Then to make matters worse, Ron and Harry steal the Weasley's car and not only lose it, Ron's dad gets a huge fine for owning it illegally. So on the one hand, Harry has a guilty conscience about costing the Weasleys so much gold, and on the other hand, he has a giant pile of gold. Now, the repeated mentions of both the poverty of the Weasley family and of Harry's guilt creates an expectation for the audience that this will be resolved in some way. And the payoff to this seeming setup is nothing. There just isn't one. The Weasleys are poor, Harry is rich and costs them a whole bunch of money and feels bad about it, and that's it. No conclusion.
Now, technically, he saves Ginny's life at the end of the story, so you can see that as a payoff to what Harry owes the Weasleys if you like, but I find that unsatisfying. I don't believe that if a different student, say, Neville, had been kidnapped by an evil book, Harry would have been like, well, I don't owe Neville's family any money, so I'm not getting involved. No, he would have saved the day anyway. This ending has nothing to do with the poverty theme. And I find this all a little frustrating in light of something which happens in the very first novel, the first time that Harry meets Ron. In this initial meeting on the train to Hogwarts, Ron can't afford to buy food from the trolley, and he's got some horrible sandwiches his mum made for him that he doesn't even like. Harry can afford to buy food from the trolley and wants to share it with Ron, so he offers to trade for some of Ron's sandwiches. Now I like this scene. It's nice. We're learning about our main characters, right? Ron is poor and embarrassed about that. Harry was poor, but then was suddenly made very rich, and he's embarrassed about that. Harry wants to share with Ron, he values friendship more than money, but he's also emotionally intelligent enough to navigate doing so without hurting Ron's feelings, hence pretending he wants some of Ron's horrible sandwiches. And if you liked this early instance of the characters managing to overcome their social embarrassment in order to share with each other, I hope you got your fill, because it's not going to be happening again. A case in point here, Ron's wand in the Chamber of Secrets. Ron's wand gets broken early on in the story. He needs a new wand, but he doesn't want to write home asking for one because he doesn't want his parents to be mad at him for breaking it, and it's not like they can afford the expense anyway. Every time Ron's broken wand came up in the story, I was thinking, why doesn't Harry just buy Ron a new wand? You know, he can afford it, Ron can't, and Harry's just watching his best friend all year try to use this broken wand that backfires and injures him and he's not doing anything. Why isn't he doing anything? So we can say maybe it's embarrassing to buy your friend a wand, but as shown in the previous novel, Harry is supposed to be emotionally intelligent enough to navigate these sorts of interactions. So the sort of thing he could do is give Ron a wand on an occasion that it's appropriate to get other people presents, right? Say, Ron's birthday or Christmas. Hogwarts celebrates Christmas, you see, and the characters give each other presents. Uh, for instance, in the Chamber of Secrets, Harry gets a tin of fudge from Hagrid, Hermione gives him a new quill, Ron gives him a book, and Harry gives them in return... nothing. Harry doesn't give his friends any Christmas presents. And this is one paragraph after the Dursleys give Harry a toothpick for Christmas, in what is supposed to be a display of Scrooge-like miserliness, but Harry doesn't even manage a toothpick for his friends. He even gets a hand-knitted sweater from Molly Weasley, which again makes him feel guilty because he stole her car, uh, but not guilty enough to actually do anything, though. Of course, the plot reason Harry can't get Ron a new wand is that Rowling wants Gilderoy Lockhart to later use the broken wand in an attempt to wipe the memories of Ron and Harry, only to have his spell bounce back at him and wipe his memory instead. But all this requires is to get the broken wand into Lockhart's hands somehow. You could write it so that Ron had a new wand, and his old broken one, then he's somehow forced by Lockhart to hand over his wand, and so Ron intentionally hands the broken one over. Now, I think that would be better. It would give Ron something active to do with the conclusion of the story, and it would make defeating Lockhart something at least partially intentional. Oh no, look, I'm writing Harry Potter fanfiction. While I'm writing fanfiction, though, I'll say that if J.K. Rowling had asked me for notes on the end of the Chamber of Secrets, I would have told her to have Harry find something valuable in the Chamber of Secrets. Salazar, Slytherin's lost gems or something, and then force that on the Weasleys at the end of the story. Now, they would refuse, of course, but he could tell them it was repayment for the car he stole. That would be a cap to everything in the novel about the Weasleys' poverty. It would assuage Harry's guilt over costing them money. And also, uh, the beginning of the next novel features Ron's family going on holiday in Egypt, which is later an important plot point. Now, how can Rowling send the Weasleys on holiday when they're so poor? Well, they just win a lottery between the books, which feels a bit random and convenient. You know, wouldn't it be nicer to see the Weasleys on holiday at the beginning of the next book because the poverty theme was adequately concluded in the preceding book? Yes, probably. Anyway, Ron's broken wand isn't the only example in the Chamber of Secrets of dramatic tension only existing because Harry's too much of a tight git to spend any money on anyone. 
In that novel, Draco Malfoy's father, Lucius, outfits the Slytherin Quidditch team with a set of fancy new brooms, Nimbus 2001s, that are much better than the brooms used by the Gryffindor team, and especially better than the older brooms used by Fred and George Weasley. And Draco taunts the Gryffindors about not being able to afford better brooms. So the Gryffindor team are set up as the poor underdogs to the rich Slytherin team who can afford the best equipment, and a despondent Harry is later seen wishing he could somehow get seven free Nimbus 2001s for their match against Slytherin. You know, if only the Gryffindor team also had a rich benefactor with a huge pile of gold and a desire to get them some new brooms. Alas. Now, reading this, I was thinking, obviously, Harry, mate, you're rich. Why do you want free brooms? Just buy some brooms. Harry didn't even buy his own broom. That was gifted to him by Professor McGonagall, the head of Gryffindor House. And that's a point, actually. When Lucius buys new brooms for the Slytherins, or Snape is seen helping the Slytherin team out by letting them train when the Gryffindors had the field booked or whatever, it's presented as a sneaky, unfair thing to do. But when McGonagall tips the scales in the favour of Hare House's Quidditch team by anonymously buying their seeker a professional racing broom, it's like, oh, what a lovely gift. Because remember, there are no good or bad actions in Harry Potter, there are only good and bad teams. And you can tell the bad team because they're ugly and fat and covered in snakes. Now the payoff to Harry being such a cheap bastard in Chamber of Secrets comes two books later in Goblet of Fire, where Harry gives Fred and George Weasley a big pile of gold so they can start their joke shop. So there we go, a couple of books late, but Harry has finally found a way to give the Weasleys some of his vast fortune. He got there in the end. Except, not really. You see, the money that Harry gives to Fred and George Weasley is his winnings from the Triwizard Tournament, and that wasn't really his money, was it? The tournament was rigged in Harry's favour by one of Voldemort's followers. Harry never would have won it by himself. Now, it's still fine for Harry to give the money to Fred and George, but this isn't really him being generous, because keeping the money at all would be wrong here. And this reminds me of when we see Harry giving Ginny a set of Gilderoy Lockhart's books, except those were gifted to Harry by Lockhart as part of a self-serving promotional stunt, so they didn't cost him anything either. When it comes to Harry's money, Rowling wants it two ways. She wants the wish-fulfillment Cinderella fantasy of the main character being whisked away from poverty to a world in which they're rich and famous and important, and she also wants to have dramatic story elements centred around poverty, story elements that could be easily solved by Harry's wealth. And the result of trying to have it both ways here is to just make Harry Potter look like kind of a selfish jerk. Now, I confess I might be off in assigning these disappointing, two books late payoffs to Rowling's adversarial relationship with feedback, but that's just how it reads to me. You know, you brats keep asking about the time turners, well, there you go, they've all been destroyed. You brats keep asking why Harry doesn't give the Weasleys gold, well, there you go, he gave Fred and George a bag of gold, now leave me alone. But the worst instance of this, at the point where it seems like Rowling is most obviously going on the offensive against her own audience, uh, is on the issue of slavery, which is what we're going to talk about next. Now, if you read the Harry Potter books as a child and haven't returned to them as an adult, or if you've only seen the movies and have never read the books, uh, be prepared for an experience, because the slavery stuff in the Harry Potter books gets really weird. So Rowling introduces slavery in the second book, The Chamber of Secrets. We're introduced early on to Dobby, a house elf, who is a slave owned by Draco Malfoy's family. He's treated very poorly, and if he disobeys the orders of his master, he's forced to physically abuse himself as punishment. Harry is shocked by all this, and responds by sympathising with Dobby, using his experience of being treated poorly by the Dursleys. He wonders why Dobby doesn't escape, he offers to do something to help. This is all a normal reaction to suddenly finding out that slavery exists in the wizarding world. Now, the end of the novel sees Harry trick Lucius Malfoy into releasing Dobby, and key here is that Dobby is happy to be released. It was set up that Dobby does not like being enslaved, and then at the end of the novel, the payoff is that Harry frees him. See, Rowling can do the setup and payoff sometimes, and that's all fine for a single story. Only, like the Time Turners, Rowling has now introduced a rather large element into her world that you would expect to feature going forward, that being racial slavery. 
But in the next novel, The Prisoner of Azkaban, apart from one passing reference to Dobby made by Malfoy, slavery is completely absent from the story. And this might lead an audience to wonder, what's the deal with all the slaves? You know, Harry freed Dobby, but Dobby isn't the only slave in the world, is he? So what's going on there? Can we get a follow-up, please, JK, to the fact that the wizards keep slaves? And what Rowling decided to do here was, to put it lightly, ill-advised. So in The Goblet of Fire, two books after The Chamber of Secrets, she introduces the positive aspects of slavery. You see, the house elves actually like being enslaved, and it would be bad, even cruel, to free them. We're introduced early on to Winky, another house elf slave who is, again, treated very poorly, but she doesn't want to be freed. And when she is freed, as a punishment, she falls into a state of depressed, listless alcoholism, and that's it, that's the conclusion to Winky's story. She was a slave, she was freed, she becomes a depressed addict. And having shown us the evils of ending slavery, uh, Rowling then takes aim at those who would seek to force this horrible state of freedom upon the slaves. You see, Hermione gets a bee in her bonnet about the existence of slavery in the wizard world, and she's particularly irked by the fact that Hogwarts runs on slave labour. The cooking and housekeeping is carried out by a whole bunch of unseen house elf slaves. Hermione creates an organisation to campaign for the freedom of the slaves, which is given a silly name, Spew, and for the trouble she's roundly mocked by basically everyone, including her friends. Hermione trying to free the slaves in a very haughty way, she's very haughty about slavery, uh, is played for laughs. It's an ongoing element of supposed comic relief. And what comes to mind first here is that tweet from Rowling where she tries to bullshit that Hermione was never canonically white and says, Rowling loves black Hermione. Uh, can you imagine if Hermione was black? for this whole subplot, you know, haughtily arguing for the end of slavery and being made fun of by her closest friends for it. Winky and Spew were cut from the movies, unsurprisingly. It is rather weird for the comic relief in your children's story to be someone attempts to end the slave trade. Now, being charitable, we can say that this whole bit with Hermione and the slaves is supposed to be a criticism of a particular type of overzealous activism, where someone inserts themselves into a political situation unnecessarily and tries to organise action that is actually counter to the wishes of the people they're trying to help, right? Rowling's taking aim at only a particular type of activist, we can say. But there are many, many problems with this. Firstly is that if this is a criticism of political activism done wrongly, there are no examples of what Rowling considers political activism done correctly in the Harry Potter novels, so Spew reads as a criticism of all political activism, not merely one particular type of activism. Next, this is all built on top of the audience's singular previous encounter with slavery prior to the fourth book, which is Dobby. Now, Dobby didn't like being enslaved, and he was happy to be freed, which becomes confusing once Rowling tries to backpedal and say, actually, the elves like slavery, because Dobby's an elf, and he doesn't like slavery, and she deals with this by saying that Dobby's just weird. And I want to talk about the scene in which we find out that Dobby is weird for not wanting to be a slave, because it really highlights just how poorly thought out this whole slavery bit is. So Hermione asks Hagrid to join her elf activism group, to which Hagrid responds, It'd be doing them an unkindness, Hermione. It's in their nature to look after humans. That's what they like, see? You'd be making them unhappy to take away the work and insulting them if you tried to pay them. But Harry set Dobby free, and he was over the moon about it, said Hermione, and we hear he's asking for wages now. Yeah, well, you get weirdos in every breed. I'm not saying there isn't the odd elf who'd take freedom, but you'll never persuade most of them to do it. So this is probably my favourite retcon ever. What, you thought Dobby was happy to be freed because slavery's bad? Well, guess what, nerd? Actually, slavery rules, and Dobby's just weird for not liking it. And on the one hand, this is funny, uh, but on the other, it's rather frustrating, right? 
This scene is set in Hagrid's hut, and Hagrid, Ron, Harry, and Hermione are present. And all of these characters should know what it's like to be discriminated against based on what are assumed to be innate characteristics. Hagrid is half-giant and has been persecuted because he's assumed to therefore be violent and dangerous. Hermione is muggle-born and is subjected to racial abuse because of that. Ron's family is pure blood, but is looked down upon for associating with muggle-borns like Hermione. And Harry not only has his whole chosen one special destiny thing going on, he has a history of being abused by the Dursleys on account of being born a wizard, right? All of the characters should have a point of reference for questioning the logic that the house elves want to be slaves because it's just in their nature. But with the exception of Hermione, they aren't questioning it. Actually, even when it comes to Hermione, there is nothing in the text that directly states she is so invested in campaigning for the elves because of her own experience of suffering racial discrimination. I doubt Rowling would have intended or even noticed that possibility. Hermione is supposed to be functioning here solely as a haughty busybody who is the punchline of a joke. So, as Rowling writes it, we're to understand that it's wrong, for instance, for people to assume Hagrid is violent because he is a giant, because it's wrong to judge him on the basis of his race rather than his actions, but it's okay to assume the house elves, on the basis of their race, want to be slaves, even though some of them, demonstrably, do not want to be. It's in their nature to look after humans, and if they say otherwise, they're just being weird. So, time for an obvious statement here. This assumption that the elves should be naturally subservient because of their race is racist, right? I mean, that's what racism is, isn't it? So, are the characters who make that argument just racists? Now, the Harry Potter series has something of a limited understanding of racism, and I don't mean intentionally limited in that it's a series aimed at children and teens and therefore isn't going to be that complicated. No, I mean limited in that the author just doesn't really understand racism. Now, don't get me wrong, Rowling understands that racism is bad, and she often makes her characters who are the bad guys be racists, but where she trips up is when she tries to understand and counter that racism. And to show you what I mean, let's talk through a couple of instances of racism in the books. So Harry's first encounter with racism in the wizard world is when he meets Malfoy in Diagon Alley in Book 1, and Malfoy states that he thinks Hogwarts shouldn't admit witches and wizards from Muggle families. An upset Harry tells Hagrid about this later, and Hagrid says, You're not from a Muggle family. You're Harry Potter. Everyone knows you belong here. Hagrid is saying basically, don't worry, that racist wasn't talking about you. Now, that's not too great of a reply, obviously, but Hagrid has another up his sleeve, he says. Anyway, what does he know about it? Some of the best I ever saw were the only ones with magic in them in a long line of muggles. Look at your mum. Look at what she had for a sister. And a similar scene takes place in Book 2, after Hermione is called a mudblood by Malfoy. Ron, explaining what mudblood means, says, There are some wizards, like Malfoy's family, who think they're better than everyone else because they're what people call pure blood. The rest of us know it doesn't make any difference at all. Look at Neville Longbottom. He's pure blood and he can hardly stand the cauldron the right way up. And then Hagrid chimes in, saying, And they haven't invented a spell our Hermione can't do. This is Rowling's counter-argument to the racism in her books. Racists are technically incorrect on the facts which is weak by itself. You see, when racists say they're better than other people, they don't actually mean more skilled, they mean fundamentally better, they are worth more as people by default. To a wizard world racist, Neville Longbottom is worth more than a thousand Hermione's because he is pure blood, so he is better. Whatever reasons racists give for their racism are not the actual reasons at all, they're the excuses for their racism. Racism, as presented by the Harry Potter series, is a conscious decision people make. A character will choose to be racist because they believe in some flawed idea, they have an incorrect belief about the world. Racists say Muggleborns are worse at magic, but look, Hermione is really good at magic, and Neville is rubbish, therefore, racism is wrong. Now this is a poor counter-argument because it accepts the logic of the racists, it just disagrees with their conclusion. 
And what does this say to Hermione exactly? You know, if you were bad at magic, Malfoy would be right to be racist about you. It's a good job you do your homework, Hermione. And in fact, when the good characters do agree with the logic of the racism, i.e. house elves are naturally subservient and slavery is the best thing for them, then it's not considered to be racism at all, it's just common sense. In J.K. Rowling's writing, the real bigotry is not, for example, believing in a hierarchical worldview with a natural slave race. Bigotry is more just being rudely incorrect. Racism is first and foremost a bad attitude. And I'd argue that this view of racism, in which it's a thing consciously engaged in with intentional rudeness, is why Rowling is ignorant of her own racism. Now, J.K. Rowling gets to racism not by conscious, rude hatred, but by way of arrogant laziness. She writes about groups of people that she doesn't know anything about, she doesn't do any research or talk to anyone who knows more than her, and so she gets herself into trouble. For instance, a few years ago, Rowling came under fire for writing an article about Navajo skinwalkers on the website Pottermore, which was a site owned by J.K. Rowling that published supplementary material and news related to the Harry Potter universe, before being rebranded to wizardingworld.com in 2019. Anyway, in this article, Rowling states that the legend of the skinwalker was made up by Native American medicine men in order to demonize real wizards, and this is something that she repeated on Twitter. And Rowling was widely criticised for appropriating a real people's cultural and spiritual traditions to use as props in her wizard stories, and the way she uses them is basically to say that their historical beliefs were made up by people who were jealous of her real wizards. Rowling's laziness really takes centre stage in the series of articles introducing the other schools of the wizarding world. For instance, the Japanese school is called Mahutakoro. Now that might not sound right to you, uh, but that is the pronunciation guide given on the website. So this name is what you would get if you used Google to translate the Japanese word for magic and the Japanese word for place, and then combined them with no regard for grammar, and then pronounced it wrong. This article starts out, This ancient Japanese school has the smallest student body of the 11 great wizarding schools, but does it? Because that's weird. About twice as many people live in Japan than in the UK, which also has its own wizard school, so why does their school have fewer students? Are Japanese people just genetically less magic than British people in Rowling's world? The South American wizard school is in Brazil, and its name is what you would get if you used Google to translate the Portuguese word for castle and the Portuguese word for wizard, and then combined them with no regard for grammar. And the resulting word Castle wizard sounds less like it's describing a castle for wizards, and more as though the castle itself is a wizard. It's also named in Portuguese, despite the school predating the Portuguese colonisation of the Americas, so what happened there? All this might seem nitpicky, but these are the sorts of questions you need to think about if you want to write about other people's cultures and histories. Rowling gets herself into trouble here because she just lazily makes it up as she goes along. Case in point from the Harry Potter series, uh, the Scottish Chinese character Cho Chang, whose name is made up of two Asian surnames, uh, which depending on how you translate them are possibly from different countries even. It'd be like calling a European character Lopez Schneider or something. Now there's been a lot of criticism of Cho Chang and a lot of wondering about how Rowling came up with the name exactly, but I know, I can solve that mystery today. You see, Rowling often names things in her books using word association. So she comes up with some words associated with the things she's trying to name, and then constructs a name out of those. So what do I call this grim old place? Grim old place. Where do the goblins keep the ingots? In Gringotts. Where do the Dursleys live? Well, they're very private, and Dudley is always whinging, so they live in Privet Drive, little whinging, right? She also names some of her characters this way, so what do I call the werewolf? Well, Remus, raised by wolves, Lupin, from the Latin for wolf, right? This character is always taking umbrage with things, so I'll just call her umbrage, that one was easy. Uh, but now here's where it gets awkward. Uh, what do I call the black guy? Well, what comes to mind when I think of a black guy? Martin Luther King? a slave in shackles, right? Kingsley Shacklebolt. Now what do I call the Asian character? What comes to mind when I think of an Asian person? 
And now, I don't even want to say what I would bet J.K. Rowling thought of here, but she thought a two-word phrase and then just changed it a little bit to get to Cho Chang. That's how she came up with that name. She used lazy racist word association. Probably. I mean, I can't prove it. Uh, to Rowling, though, because none of this is consciously aggressive, because it isn't intentionally racist, it doesn't really count. And so it goes in the novels with those who support the slavery of the house elves. Hagrid, for instance, can argue in favour of slavery perfectly politely. On the other hand, it's Hermione who is presented as obnoxious and rude. She is the one with the bad attitude. Now, in all of the scenes discussing the slavery of the house elves, readers might note the lack of opinions held by our own point-of-view character, Harry Potter. The Harry Potter novels are written from a limited third-person perspective that is closely tied to a single point-of-view character, which is usually Harry Potter, although there are a few chapters written from the point-of-view of other characters. What this means is that the narration, and therefore the reader, has access to Harry's inner thoughts and feelings. If Harry is embarrassed, we can just be told he was feeling embarrassed, but if Ron is embarrassed, the narration has to say something like Ron looked embarrassed, because the narration doesn't have direct access to the other character's thoughts and feelings, like it does for Harry. I mention this here to highlight how, after his initial surprised outburst about Dobby's slavery in the Chamber of Secrets, Harry Potter doesn't really have any opinions about slavery. In the slavery debates in the books, Harry is mostly just a passive, thoughtless observer. Hermione obviously opposes slavery very strongly, and Ron finds this laughable and mocks her for it, and claims that slavery is acceptable because the elves like it. Uh, but Harry, our point of view character, just sits there silently, not thinking anything for the most part. When he does voice an opinion, it's only to wonder when Hermione is gonna give up on the activism thing. He doesn't appear to have any strong opinions other than Hermione should stop talking about it. Even when Harry finds out that Professor Slughorn has been using a Hogwarts house elf to test his drinks for deadly poison, this is after one of his drinks was actually poisoned, by the way, Harry's only thought is how outraged Hermione would be if she heard about that. When our hero, Harry Potter, hears that his teacher is testing what is potentially fatal poison, on slaves, he just thinks, wow, it's a good job Hermione isn't here, because she'd probably be really annoying about this. Now, the other major house elf character in the books is Creature, who Harry inherits after the death of Sirius Black, so our main character becomes a slave owner, that's nice. Creature is depicted as miserable and insulting, he's horrible to everyone, and everyone is horrible to him in return. Harry also inherits Sirius's house, Twelve Grimmauld Place, which is decorated with decapitated slave heads. And in the novel where this house first appears, The Order of the Phoenix, at Christmas time, our main characters decorate the house for Christmas, which involves putting Little Father Christmas hats and beards on the slave heads. So our heroes decide to decorate their decapitated slave heads with little Christmas hats. Now, I'm going to need to hit pause here, next to the Christmas slave heads, and ask, what is happening right now? Why are the Harry Potter books like this? And we're going to have to go on a few tangents here, but stick with me. So, say you're an author and you want to put slavery as a theme into your children's fantasy series. Now, how do we do that? Well, there's a few ways to go about it. The first is to just make the only slave owners bad people, right? So only the bad characters like the Malfoys own slaves, and all the good characters oppose it. Maybe there's a political effort to free the slaves, but the old racist pure-blood families keep using their wealth and power to block it, right? So you've got a very clear good-bad dividing line on the issue of slavery. That's the simplistic, straightforward way to do it. The more complicated way to do it is have slavery be a systemic issue inherent to the whole wizarding society. And at first glance, it seems that this is what Rowling is going for. Characters who are otherwise presented as good people defend slavery. Hagrid argues it's in their nature. Ron says they like being slaves. Molly wishes she had a slave to do the laundry, even though she can do housework by magic, and so on. And this systemic problem is even explicitly tied to the rise of the main antagonist of the series. 
Now you might expect the main character of this story to be an outsider, freshly introduced into the wizarding world, who can see through the inequalities that they take for granted, who can introduce a new perspective. But Harry is not given that role, it's given instead to Hermione, and only to mock how silly it is. Now the real issue comes at the end of this story, because if you want to have a happy ending where your characters triumph, where evil is conquered, where all is well, then the systemic problem of slavery requires a systemic resolution, i.e. the slaves have to be freed, or all is not well, is it? But what we need to understand here is that J.K. Rowling can't free the slaves in her story. This is the reason she has to backpedal slavery into not being that bad, because after she introduces it, she can't fundamentally change it, and she can't do that because of her real-world political beliefs. And to understand those, uh, we need to talk about neoliberalism. Now, whenever the politics of Harry Potter are brought up online, someone will post this screen cap from an image board where the author of the post lays what they see as the failings of the Harry Potter story at the feet of J.K. Rowling being, quote, a liberal, centrist Blairite who doesn't really believe in anything. But is this accurate, and what does it mean exactly? So, very quick. In 1979, Margaret Thatcher came to power in the UK. Yes, sorry, we're doing this. Her government was in power throughout the 80s and enforced and oversaw a national political realignment. Previously, in the period after World War II, the UK instituted various welfare reforms paid for by high taxes, uh, a national healthcare service was established, there was wide support for trade unions, and various industries and services were nationalised, that is, brought into public ownership. Now, Thatcher's government can be characterised as a total shift away from all of this. Unions were broken up, national industries and services were privatised and sold off, there were tax cuts for the rich, and there was a whole bunch of financial deregulation. This was a philosophy of smaller government, of diminishing collective action, and a greater emphasis on individual responsibility. Thatcher even once stated, quote, There is no such thing as society. There are individual men and women, and there are families, which, of course, doesn't make any sense. Now, after Thatcher came to power, there were 18 years of conservative rule in the UK, and this led to Tony Blair rebranding the Labour Party to New Labour and shifting the party to the right to appeal to conservative voters. So Blair abandoned Labour's previous support for renationalisation and embraced the free market. He moved away from seeking an equality of outcome and towards a supposedly meritocratic equality of opportunity. Everyone should have the opportunity to succeed. He basically said to the Conservatives, we are not going to fight you on how the economy should fundamentally be organised. You win. We give up. We now have the same aims in that regard. We're no longer going to be seeking any serious structural change. We're going to keep things organised as they are. We're just going to argue that we can run things more competently than you can. Thatcher is said to have later claimed that the rebranding of Labour to New Labour was her greatest political accomplishment. Now, I don't know if she actually said that, but if she did, she was right. Now, if you're from the US and want to understand all this, you can swap Thatcher out for Reagan and Blair for Bill Clinton, and you'll have a rough outline. So anyway, this support for free market capitalism and associated policies of deregulation, privatisation, the reduction of government welfare spending, and a greater focus on individualism is known as neoliberalism. Neo meaning new, because it was a resurgence of economic liberalism. So what does all this have to do with J.K. Rowling? Well, J.K. Rowling is an enormous fan of Tony Blair and New Labour. She is actually personal friends with Blair's successor, Gordon Brown, who before before becoming Prime Minister himself served as Blair's Chancellor of the Exchequer for a decade, for non-UK folks the Chancellor is basically our Chief Finance Minister. Rowling was present for the birth of Gordon Brown's son, and she donated very large amounts of money to his government, and has subsequently sung its praises on her social media accounts. She has also been harshly critical of those within Labour who would seek to move the party back to the left. J.K. Rowling's political philosophy is that of New Labour's neoliberalism, with its focus on individual instead of collective action, its promise of no serious systemic change, its push for equality of opportunity over equality of outcome, and most importantly, for a billionaire, its pledge not to raise taxes.
Now with this worldview in mind, back to Harry Potter. So, in the Harry Potter series, while individual actions can be good or bad, systemic actions that threaten the status quo are always wrong. Systemic change is always wrong. This is why it can be seen as good for Harry to free one slave, but bad for Hermione to want to free all the slaves, because one is an individual change and one is a systemic change. From the time Harry enters Hogwarts to the epilogue two decades after he leaves, there are no examples in any of the Harry Potter novels of a positive systemic change. Above an individual level, nothing changes for the better. Flawed systems are portrayed, but the answer to those flaws is always to replace the individual assumed to be responsible for them. The system itself is above being questioned. Now this attitude can be seen in Harry's interactions with the Ministers of Magic, first Cornelius Fudge and later Rufus Scrimjaw. Scrimjaw? I have no idea if I'm saying that right. Fudge is portrayed as an incompetent coward, someone too terrified of Voldemort to take any action, whereas Scrimjaw is the opposite, so keen to be seen to be taking action that he abuses his authority to arrest and imprison the wrong people. The authority of the Ministry is carried out by their Aurors, who are basically the wizard police force. And it's interesting to note what Harry sees this authority used to do. Uh, aside from the more general racial discrimination enforced by the Ministry, Harry sees them falsely imprison his godfather in their torture prison, Azkaban, then later hunt him. They falsely imprison his friend Hagrid, they attack Dumbledore in his office in an attempt to arrest him, and Harry later sees the whole apparatus of the Ministry fall under Voldemort's control and be used to carry out his bidding. But throughout all this, Harry never, at any point, questions the Ministry's right to rule. He never questions whether or not they should have the authority to do what they're doing. He only ever questions their competency. Even after everything he witnesses the Ministry do, Harry's main ambition in life remains to become an Aura. He wants to be a cop working for this government. This is the result of an automatic, unthinking respect given to the status quo. The political and social systems that currently exist are treated as fundamental forces that are inherent to the world, like gravity. They can persecute you and your friends, they can even try to kill you, but they must never be questioned. For a very clear example of this in Rowling's writing, let's briefly talk about the first Fantastic Beasts movie. So these movies are a complete tonal mess. They're trying to appeal to the little kids with the Fantastic Beasts angle, you know, all the magical animals escaped. Can Newt the zookeeper track them down and get them back into his magical suitcase? You know, that's a nice, low-stakes kids story, right? But they're also trying to appeal to the older Harry Potter fans, so the movies are also, awkwardly, about the conflict between Dumbledore and Grindelwald. So as well as Newt Scamander trying to catch his mischievous escaped Niffler, we also get to see a fascist execute an actual baby. It's just all over the place with the tone. Anyway. Midway through the first movie, which, keep in mind, is supposed to be about a magical zookeeper, uh, we're treated to a horrific execution scene as Newt and his friend, the ex Tina, are sentenced to death by the American Ministry of Magic, so there's suddenly much higher stakes than you'd expect. So they're taken to a place called a death cell, they've got a death cell, uh, to be summarily executed by being submerged into a death potion, which also exists, and Newt and Tina have to stage an escape. Now notable here is that Tina works with these people, she's on first name terms with the executioner even, and they just take her off to be killed. Anyway, at the end of the film, after Newt and Tina are back on good terms with the American Ministry, Tina thanks Newt for putting in a good word for her, and getting her her job back. And you might be wondering, she still wants to work at the Ministry? They just, like just right now, tried to actually execute her, and she has nothing to say about that. You know, should the wizards have a death cell? Should they be able to execute people without a trial? Doesn't really matter, I guess. Water under the bridge now, eh? The Harry Potter stories are sometimes mischaracterized as anti-authority, even by Rowling herself, who has stated that she wants readers to take away the message that they should question authority. 
She even has Harry laugh at Vernon for wondering why the Ministry of Magic can't protect them from Voldemort. It was so very typical of his uncle to put his hopes in the establishment. You see, Harry's laughing at Vernon here for not questioning the competency of authority, but what Harry and Rowling do not realise is that Harry is not much different from his uncle here. Because while Harry will question the competency of authority, he never questions its legitimacy. He and the series as a whole are not anti-authority, they are anti the wrong people having authority. One fun scene here is in the Half-Blood Prince, when a frustrated Harry wishes he had the power of the Minister of Magic to have his secret police follow Malfoy around, uh, and then Harry remembers that he does actually have that power. He has the power of slavery, and then he orders Creature to follow Malfoy. Now, written by anyone else, this might be a funny commentary on how police serve those in power, but no, this is just our main character who wishes he was a cop ordering his slave around. No, Harry Potter is not anti-authority. Even when Harry breaks the rules, like when he sets up a secret organisation for learning defence against the dark arts, it's in service to the ultimate authority in the wizarding world, the status quo. Harry sets up this club while Hogwarts is under the rule of Dolores Umbridge, who insists practical defence against the dark arts is unnecessary. Umbridge is presented as a strict authoritarian who ruthlessly punishes rule breakers, but of course the stealth real problem with Umbridge is that she represents change. Her real evil is that she is changing Hogwarts from how it was when Harry first encountered it, and so Harry and his pals have to break the rules in order to do what they were supposed to be doing anyway, studying practical defence against the dark arts. Harry and his friends oppose the authority of Umbridge, not because they are anti-authority, but because they are anti-Umbridge. And of course, the solution to Umbridge's abuse of authority is simply to replace her with a good authoritarian, swapping a bad individual for a good individual, but leaving the system unchanged. This is the problem injected into the Harry Potter series by Rowling's political philosophy. While she can portray societal problems, she cannot even conceive of societal solutions to those problems. The problems might be systemic, but the solutions must always be individual. Allow me to go on another tangent within this tangent and talk about the casual vacancy. So The Casual Vacancy is the first novel written by Rowling after the publication of the Harry Potter novels, and is very useful for us here for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it's an explicitly political novel set in the real world. It is centred around local council politics. Secondly, it is explicitly a novel for adults. It contains depictions of domestic violence, sexual assault, child abuse and neglect, suicide, self-harm, and so on. So if your response to any of my criticisms of Rowling's writing in Harry Potter is that Harry Potter is for children, well, that doesn't apply to The Casual Vacancy, which is very much not meant for kids. The Casual Vacancy is set in Pagford, a fictional, stereotypical, picturesque English village. And the political plot of the novel is concerned with the border between Pagford and a nearby larger city. There is currently a council estate full of poor people on Pagford's side of the border, and there's a plot in the local council to change the border so that the estate will fall on the other side. This would mean that the council estate will fall outside the catchment area of Pagford School, so the poor children will no longer be able to attend. And the council also seek to close down a drug rehabilitation clinic in use by the inhabitants of the council estate. Those seeking this change are presented unsympathetically. They are conservative, they're small-minded, they're cruel, and their response to social problems is to sweep them under the rug to make them someone else's responsibility. Now, on the other side of the debate, we have the members of the Pagford Council who argue against the border change, who want things to remain as they are. Now, principal among these is Barry Fairbrother, who himself was born on the council estate before attending Pagford's fancy school, studying hard, and becoming a bank manager. So he is a living example of the opportunity he's trying to preserve for the other inhabitants of the estate. So Rowling portrays several serious social problems caused by poverty and inequality, but in response to these problems, the best her characters can imagine to do is to perpetuate the status quo. The political conflict in the novel is between a side who want to actively change society for the worse, and the side who want to keep things as they are. There is no one who argues that the system should be changed for the better, 
even if the more sympathetic characters win, all they will achieve is a continuation of the current state of affairs, along with its rampant poverty and inequality. But in Rowling's world, there can be no systemic solution to poverty, because poverty is unchangeable, it's simply a fact of life. There can only be the individual opportunity to escape it. Nobody is arguing that the poor residents of the council estate deserve a better life, they only deserve the opportunity to prove themselves worthy of a better life. We muggles have no sorting hat to simply tell us who is good and bad, instead we have meritocracy to sort the deserving from the undeserving. Will you become a depressed drug addict, or will you go to school and work hard? And if you work hard enough, even the poorest among us can become a bank manager. How inspiring. You too can ascend the financial system that's causing the poverty you escaped from. Now, I'm not saying stories with social problems necessarily have to fully resolve those social problems by the end, because they don't. But if you're trying to tell a societal story, then your society should be a living thing. It should be at least potentially flexible, contain at least the possibility for change, both good and bad. But Rowling's worlds are set in stone. They're dead. The good in Rowling's story seeks only to cancel out evil, to undo evil's changes. The solution to systemic problems is never to seek systemic change, but to be individually nicer, to have nicer bank managers, to have nicer slave owners. Which brings us back to the slave heads in the Little Christmas hats. The solution to the systemic problem of slavery in the Harry Potter novels is for individuals to be nicer to their slaves. I'm not kidding, that is the cap to the slavery theme. Creature betrays Sirius because Sirius was mean to him, but Harry and friends learn to be nice to Creature, after which he serves them loyally. This is the payoff here. Be nice to your slaves. This is laid out explicitly in an article about slavery on the Pottermore website, uh, so this article is titled To Spew or Not To Spew, Hermione Granger and the Pitfalls of Activism. If Hogwarts had a debating club, what might it say on the subject of elf rights? We explored both sides of the argument spurred by Hermione and Spew. So that's right, we're going to debate the pros and cons of slavery. Firstly, the article covers Hermione's argument against slavery, but crucially, it gets it wrong. After witnessing the mistreatment of Winky at the Quidditch World Cup, Hermione discovered there were house elves at Hogwarts cooking and cleaning for zero pay, and yet nobody seemed to care. Horrified to the point where she couldn't stomach the Hogwarts feast, she described the situation in two words, slave labour. While it sounds heavy-handed, no it doesn't, that's just what it is, Hermione does have a point. No matter how you slice it, house elves are unpaid labourers, magically bound to serve, left at the mercy of their respective owners. The system is ripe for abuse. Now, this is where the article rarely goes wrong, because the system is not ripe for abuse. It is abuse. The problem is not that slave owners might be mean to their slaves, it's that they own slaves at all. This is one thing Rowling and her books don't get about slavery. Slavery is wrong. <laughs> slavery is wrong, regardless of what the slaves think, because it's wrong to benefit from slavery at all. The article then goes on to list the arguments in favour of slavery, and it says, Miss Granger is at best overzealous, and her goals are at worst unattainable. Hermione may have meant well, but at the same time did end up dragging a peaceful group into a political battlefield just because she felt that's what they should want. Was she helping or interfering in a culture she didn't understand? Oh boy, haughty old Hermione bringing politics into everything, even our peaceful system of slavery. On the subject of Winky, the freed slave who becomes a depressed alcoholic, the article says, is it right exposing elves to such a fate? From here it seems downright irresponsible. Even if the long-term good outweighs the bad, the state of poor Winky ought to be a bigger cause for alarm. Now, I don't know what to say here about this article arguing that it's irresponsible to free slaves, so I'm just going to move on. The article summarises its arguments by saying that even when people are well-meaning, there's always the risk of doing more harm than good, and that Hermione ought to be careful Tricking elves into freedom is arguably as unethical as enslavement. 
This article doesn't exist anymore, by the way. They took it down for what I hope are obvious reasons. Anyway, the article concludes with its message about being nice to your slaves. Before we go, let's consider Creature. Think of how he changed when treated with kindness by his new master, Harry Potter. Previously, he'd been bitter and unpleasant. Not to mention a liability to his previous owner. Had Sirius treated him a little better, things might have worked out differently. Dumbledore was right. Being kind to Creature was in everyone's best interests. Ugh. I think we need a palate cleanser after that, so allow me to briefly tell you a different story. So, the Discworld novel Snuff is part of the City Watch series, which are like fantasy crime novels, basically. In that book, Sam Vimes, the commander of the City Watch, is on holiday in the countryside when he uncovers evidence of a plot to enslave goblins and force them to work on tobacco plantations. So the crime to be solved in this crime novel is the slavery of a sapient magical race. Now, most people on the Discworld think of the goblins more as pests than as people. Goblins are small and weird, and they have cultural and spiritual practices that are difficult for outsiders to understand. For instance, they store all of their bodily secretions in little pots that they carry around. The dominant society of the Discworld is undergoing a change akin to our Industrial Revolution, with the advent of technologies like trains and wireless communication, and this society does not see goblins as useful, it sees them as outsiders, as savages, and they're treated like vermin. So when Vimes arrives in the countryside for his holiday and finds that the local pub is called the Goblin's Head, and that there is an actual stuffed goblin head mounted on the wall, he doesn't think too much of it. After all, it's only a goblin, isn't it? If there's a hierarchy of cultures on the Discworld in terms of power they have and respect they receive, the goblins are very much on the bottom. And intelligently here, Pratchett shows how the attitude that the goblins are somehow lesser beings has even been accepted to a degree by the goblins themselves. Notably, we're told that when a group of goblins was rounded up to be enslaved, they went passively and did not fight back. As Vimes begins investigating the murder of a goblin, and then later the slavery of the goblins, however, he has cause to interact with them. And in the course of these interactions, he realises that rather than being vermin, they are thinking and feeling beings, just like him. He speaks to a goblin who is air quotes civilised, she can speak his language and play the harp. And on talking to this goblin, on coming to the realisation that they are people, Vimes remembers the goblin head mounted on the wall of the pub, and he thinks to himself, someone is going to burn. And then just a few pages later, Vimes goes to the pub, puts the landlord in a headlock, and tells him that if he doesn't take the goblin head off the wall, then he's going to set the building on fire. And I can't tell you how cathartic this was to read after slogging through seven novels of Harry Potter's passive, uninterested acceptance of the world as it is. Imagine a hero who gets actually angry at injustice and then does something about it. What a treat. Also, goblins don't have rights in the Discworld. There's nothing illegal about rounding up goblins and shipping them off somewhere, but that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's legal or not, and it doesn't matter if the goblins protest or not. Snuff says slavery is still a crime. Now, Snuff ends, spoiler alert, with goblins being granted rights and protections under the law. Because obviously, if your story is about a systemic injustice and you want your heroes to triumph and have a happy ending, then that injustice needs a systemic correction. And of course, the goblin's head comes off the wall of the pub. Now, I don't know if Snuff was intended to be a response to Rowling's house elves at all, but the bit with the stuffed head mounted on the wall certainly makes it read as though it is. If Rowling had written Snuff, Vimes would save the one goblin he met who could play the harp, and the rest of them would still be on the tobacco plantation. Actually, the first Fantastic Beasts movie has just such an ending. In that movie, Newt Scamander makes a muggle friend, Jacob, who works in a canning factory. It's the only work he can find, and he hates it, and it's miserable. Him and his fellow workers are, as he states, dying in there. Working in the factory, quote, crushes the life out of you. Jacob's dream is to open his own bakery, but lacks the funds to do so, and can't get approved for a loan by the bank. Then at the end of the movie, Newt Scamander gives Jacob a bunch of magical silver eggs, which he uses to set up his bakery. 
He also leaves him a note saying he's wasted in a canning factory. But I was thinking during these scenes, what about these other guys? still working at the canning factory. Don't they have dreams? Don't they have things they'd rather be doing than toiling away in the canning factory? Where are their magic eggs, exactly? I guess it's their fault, really, for not also making a magical friend who can give them some magical money. And ultimately, the world still needs things canned, doesn't it? So back in the factory, you lot. We've already selected the one special person among you who is worthy of a better life. Anyway, I want now to ask a question. Uh, the excuses that Rowling's characters give for keeping the elves in slavery, uh, they like it, it's the best thing for them, if we set them free they'd just become troublesome drunks, uh, these are obviously similar to real-world excuses for the continued enslavement of groups of humans. These were arguments once made about the supposed dangers of freeing enslaved black people in the United States, for instance. Now, Rowling would argue that the elves in her books are not supposed to be a commentary on any real-world instances of slavery, but my question is, does it matter what the intention was here? And I'd argue no, it doesn't. If the similarities exist, they exist regardless of what the author's intent was. Uh, and with that said, I think it's time to talk about Rowling's goblins. Now, Rowling's goblins have been widely criticised as anti-Semitic, appearing as they do similar to anti-Semitic stereotypes of Jewish people. Uh, they're greedy, they're untrustworthy, they run the banking system, and the Harry Potter people didn't do themselves any favours in this regard by having a large six-pointed star appear on the floor of Gringotts in the first movie. That was, uh, unfortunate, wasn't it? You didn't want to edit that out, no? throw a rug over it or something. Now, of course, many fantasy stories use fantasy races as stand-ins for groups of real humans. I talked in a recent video about the Discworld's dwarves, for instance, being used to both explore LGBT issues and conflicts between the moderately religious and the more hardline religious. Star Trek, as another example, uses fantasy races to comment on particular real-world issues. Think of the alien race who are half white and half black, but still discriminate against one another, and are used, in a rather heavy-handed way, uh, to highlight the absurdity of racism. Star Trek also uses real-world cultures as a basis for many of its races. Uh, the Romulans are based on ancient Rome, for example. The Klingons, in their various incarnations, draw from several cultures. Uh, the Mongol Empire, there's some ancient Japan, uh, some Vikings. Uh, but I want to talk about the Ferengi here. I want to compare the Ferengi to Rowling's goblins. Now, the Ferengi are portrayed as a culture driven primarily by material wealth profit and exploitation. They are capitalists, basically. They're used to represent and parody us, you know, humans as we exist now, before we became utopian space communists. But it's also not hard to imagine the same criticisms aimed at Rowling's goblins being also aimed at the Ferengi, with their oversized facial features and obsessive greed. And indeed, over the years, people have accused the Ferengi of being similar to anti-Semitic stereotypes, so is there a difference here? Now, to start, I should say that it's not my place to say whether or not anyone can or cannot get offended by the way the Ferengi are depicted. That's not up to me. But I think we can use the Ferengi here to show what I'd argue is a big problem with not only Rowling's goblins, but her handling of fantasy races in general. So, in their first few appearances on The Next Generation, the Ferengi were used as recurring villains, essentially. They're a contrast to the humans of the Federation in that they're greedy and duplicitous and very misogynistic. And if this is how the Ferengi remained, I'd have nothing more to say here. They would be like Rowling's goblins. What complicates the Ferengi is their later appearances, particularly on the show Deep Space Nine, which introduces several Ferengi characters to the main cast, principal among these being Quark, the owner of the space station's bar. And what we see in this show are Ferengi who grow to differ from their society's expectation of what a good Ferengi should be. We see Quark's nephew Nog insisting he wants to join Starfleet rather than go into business. We see Quark's brother Rom organise a labour strike in protest of how he treats his employees. Even Quark himself occasionally passes up profit in favour of doing the right thing. 
And we see that wider Ferengi society is also subject to change. Ferengi women, previously forbidden from even wearing clothes, are granted rights over the course of the series, among other political changes. What this all means is that we now know that though the Ferengi are typically greedy and selfish and opportunistic and sexist, they do not have to be. These traits are the cultural and social traits of a particular society, a society that is alive and is subject to change. Over time, the Ferengi become less arguably a stand-in for any one particular group of humans, and more arguably a representation of how people behave under certain societal and cultural conditions. After we witness the existence of Ferengi who defy societal norms and the flexibility of Ferengi society itself, these traits can no longer be construed as simply racial traits. But J.K. Rowling, as we've seen, cannot write flexible societies, so she cannot give any of this additional characterization to her fantasy races. There is none of the depth to Rowling's goblins like there comes to be for the Ferengi. They simply are the way they are because they are goblins. Their different beliefs and behaviours stem from the fact that they are, as Bill Weasley puts it, a different breed of being. The traits of Rowling's fantasy races are, in the main, racial traits. Now there's an ongoing conversation about the presentation of fixed racial traits in fantasy races, particularly when it comes to questions of morality, of a race being inherently good or evil. Wizards of the Coast recently removed the racial alignments from the fantasy races of Dungeons and Dragons, for instance, and I agree with that move, I think it's a good one. Not only does it create the opportunity for more interesting stories, a fantasy world having certain races who are just evil by default obviously has some problematic real-world parallels. Uh, but back to Rowling's Goblins. Uh, the principal goblin character in the Harry Potter story is Griphook, who is the goblin from book one who takes Harry to see his giant pile of gold for the first time, and then he returns in the final book to help Harry and his friends break into Gringotts in order to retrieve one of Voldemort's horcruxes. Potentially troublesome for this alliance is the history of animosity between wizards and goblins. Goblins are remaining neutral in the conflict with Voldemort, they see it as a wizard matter for wizards to deal with. Griphook and Ron have an argument. Griphook complains about the fact that wizards treat goblins as second-class citizens, and Ron counters that the goblins aren't perfect either, and have metal-working secrets they refuse to share with the wizards or whatever. Also complicating things is that goblins have a different idea about the concept of ownership than wizards do. For goblins, whoever first creates an object is the owner, and subsequent purchases are basically rentals, meaning the goblins see goblin-made objects like the Sword of Gryffindor as belonging to the goblins. So what a tricky situation our heroes find themselves in. However, are they going to convince Griphook to ally with them, considering all their differences and the history of division between goblins and wizards? And the answer is, they don't. Harry gets Griphook to work with them temporarily by promising to give him the Sword of Gryffindor, but intends to betray him and keep the sword until Voldemort is gone. Griphook likewise betrays Harry and steals the sword midway through the mission before abandoning him, and then despite that, Harry and his friends successfully attain the Horcrux and escape anyway. So what was the point, we might wonder, of all that stuff about the division between goblins and wizards? You know, here's a history of racial conflict, some racial differences that prove to be irreconcilable, and then it doesn't matter anyway. It's set up like Harry and his friends are going to have to find some way to navigate this conflict in their world, but then they don't, they fail at that, uh, but then they still succeed at their ultimate goal anyway, so it didn't matter. It's almost like Rowling's in two minds about the politics of the fantasy races in her novels. She clearly wants those elements in there, otherwise they wouldn't be in there, but she doesn't want them to actually mean anything or affect the plot in any significant way. What Harry Potter is really missing is a good old council scene, right? So there's a big evil threat to the world, once fought defeated but recently resurgent, and to defeat it is going to take unity and cooperation. However, the peoples of the world are divided. They bicker amongst themselves, and their divisions are exploited by the evil antagonist in order to facilitate his return to power. 
Now in Lord of the Rings, Sauron is defeated, in a strictly mechanical sense, by throwing the ring into Mount Doom. But that act is only possible after the story resolves those previous divisions that it set up. So Rohan needs to be saved. Rohan needs to answer Gondor's call for aid. Legolas and Gimli need to become friends. The Alliance needs to mount a last stand to draw Sauron's forces out of Mordor. Only then is it actually possible to defeat Sauron. In Harry Potter, similar elements are set up in their conflict with Voldemort, but then they just don't pay off. The slaves aren't freed, non-human races aren't given equal rights, the goblins remain neutral, Harry and Griphook betray each other, nothing changes in the world, but then they just win anyway. A lot's been said about the disappointing ending of Harry Potter, but like a lot of disappointing endings, it's not that the author was writing a good story and then just messed up at the conclusion, rather it's the point at which you're forced to realise that you're never getting a payoff to a lot of what was set up, it's where you have to realise that you've just been reading a disappointing story. There's a scene at the end of the last Harry Potter book after the defeat of Voldemort, which is like a peek into an alternate universe where the story was actually good. McGonagall had replaced the house tables, but nobody was sitting according to house anymore. All were jumbled together, teachers and pupils, ghosts and parents, centaurs and house elves. Now this could have been a very powerful image. If defeating Voldemort had meant defeating his supremacist ideology and achieving equality, uh, this scene with all the different people and races sitting where they like, unsegregated, would have been a fitting conclusion. Uh, but the Harry Potter series we have never earns this ending. None of these themes end up being important at all in Harry's final confrontation with Voldemort. The centaurs join the final battle not because anything has changed for them, but because Hagrid nags them, basically. The house elves join the final battle, led by Creature, not because anything has changed for them, but because Harry is just such a nice slave owner. And as for Harry and Voldemort, Rowling has them talking primarily about wand mechanics. You see, Voldemort previously couldn't kill Harry because their wands share a core, or something, so he sought out the Elder Wand, the most powerful wand in the world, in order to finish Harry off for good. The problem is the Elder Wand will only obey its master, and that isn't the person who's holding it, that's the person who defeated its previous owner. Voldemort thinks he is the master of the wand because he killed Snape, who killed Dumbledore, who was the previous master of the wand. Harry thinks he is the master of the wand because before Dumbledore was killed he was disarmed by Draco, who was in turn later disarmed by Harry at Malfoy Manor, an event for which the Elder Wand was not present. So, the question is this, does the Elder Wand somehow know that Harry took Draco's wand from him even though it wasn't there, and will the Elder Wand therefore not work when Voldemort uses it to try to cast a killing curse at Harry? And the answer is, of course, who cares? Why is this what Harry and Voldemort are talking about in their final showdown? You know, seven novels of conflict, and their final fight is decided upon by the inscrutable, just-introduced mechanics of a sentient magical stick. They may as well have flipped a coin to decide who wins the final fight. So the stick decides in Harry's favour, and Voldemort's spell bounces back at him and kills him. He goes out pretty much the same as Gilderoy Lockhart, trying to use a broken wand that backfires and hits him instead. Harry has no active part in any of this, he's just a prop off which Voldemort bounces a spell exactly the same as when he was a baby. Now, not only does the Harry Potter series not earn the scene with all the Hogwarts houses and races sitting wherever they please, it actually undermines it in the actual ending of Harry Potter, the epilogue set 19 years in the future, which shows Harry sending his son off to Hogwarts, with his son worrying that he'll be sorted into Slytherin. So, they've kept Slytherin, they've still kept Slytherin there. Now, I know it's an old joke, why doesn't Hogwarts just get rid of the evil house, uh, but they definitely should have after the fall of Voldemort, when the entirety all of the Slytherin student body either fled or joined Voldemort. But more than just Slytherin, they've kept the segregation of the school children. The desegregation was just a one-day affair, I guess, and I suppose the house elves got a 15-minute break after Voldemort was killed, and then it was back to work. 
Actually, the final sentence of the final novel, prior to the epilogue, is Harry wondering if he can get Creature, his slave, to bring him a sandwich. Anyway, this epilogue, where all the characters have paired off and had a dozen kids all named after the characters who died in the series, is embarrassing to start. It's worse than the cringiest fan fiction. But it's also depressing, because it reveals to us that nothing has changed in this world. This is presented by Rowling as though it's a good thing, but in reality the ending of Harry Potter is even more dismal an ending than in 1984. Slavery was not ended, equality was not achieved, we're still segregating the school children according to supposedly innate characteristics. We learned nothing, basically, but now it's 19 years later, and my scar is not hurting, so all is well. Harry Potter is ultimately not the right character for the story he's in. Harry, as a mostly passive audience point of view, works in the first few novels, but as the series goes on and Rowling fully reveals all the problems inherent to the wizarding world, Harry's passivity becomes an unintentional, tragic flaw. We learn in The Cursed Child that an adult Harry has become the head of magical law enforcement. He is the top cop in the wizarding world. It's now his day job to ensure that nothing changes in his society. And he's friends with Hermione, who is now the Minister for Magic. Hermione did the most homework, which means she gets to be the Prime Minister. Because you see, the real magic in Harry Potter is a functional neoliberal meritocracy. Harry Potter is not just a Cinderella fantasy, it's a liberal fantasy, one in which conservatives get bullied, evil defeats itself, and societal change is unnecessary because the slaves like it where they are. Harry Potter asks what if a hierarchy of wealth and power, but everyone was in their rightful place. Now before I leave today, there's still one very pressing question that we haven't answered. Why didn't the wizards stop Hitler? Why didn't the wizards use their magic to prevent the various atrocities of World War II? Now, you might say, it doesn't matter. It's a joke question. There is absolutely no reason we need an actual answer to it. But I feel like I know what's been happening inside J.K. Rowling's mind, post the main Harry Potter series. You brats keep asking why the wizards didn't stop World War II. Well, I'll show you. So the Fantastic Beasts movies are set in the decade prior to World War II, and one of antagonist Gellert Grindelwald's stated motivations for his actions is to prevent World War II. Not cause it, but prevent it. At a rally, he shows prophecies of images from World War II. We see the Blitz, a nuclear bomb going off, and a column of people marching beside a series of train cars. So, very classy. Thank you, Fantastic Beasts movies. Come for the whimsical, magical animals. Stay for the grim portrayals of the Holocaust. Now, you might say Grindelwald is being disingenuous in his stated desire to prevent World War II, and is just using it as an excuse to attract people to his cause, but as an audience watching it today, we know that he was right. His prophecies were accurate, these things did happen, and we also know that the wizards didn't stop World War II, and this isn't some dangerous butterfly effect messing about with the time machine stuff. These events are future events for the characters in the story. There's no reason they shouldn't want to prevent this, but the only person who even claims to want to prevent it is the bad guy. Now what this means is that when Dumbledore and Newt Scamander and their fantastic beasts are fighting against Grindelwald, they're fighting to save World War II and make sure that it happens. This is the anti-change ideology of the Harry Potter series taken to its logical end point, right? The wizards didn't stop Hitler, because stopping Hitler is wrong. Now, I've no idea how close the Fantastic Beasts movies are actually going to get to World War II, but Rowling once stated on Twitter that the series is supposed to end in 1945, which would mean that they cover all of it. Now, I'll end with a plea from me to J.K. Rowling today. So listen, Joanne, please don't. This isn't something we need to see. There's no good answer to the question, why didn't the wizards stop Hitler? You can't write your way out of this. You're not good enough. Just accept it. The best case scenario here is that this series gets cancelled before we see what you're planning. 
Now, before I go today, I'm going to wrap up with a few clarifications. Uh, firstly, this video is not meant to be an exhaustive list of everything wrong with Harry Potter. Uh, there's plenty I didn't mention. Uh, for instance, Rowling once stated that her werewolves were supposed to be a metaphor for having HIV, and then she made one of her main werewolf characters a predator who attacks children to purposely infect them with werewolfism. I didn't mention that. Well, I did right now as an example of something I didn't mention, but you know what I mean. I'd also like to make clear that Harry Potter's anti-change problem is by no means unique. Think of all the Hollywood blockbusters in which the good side are those seeking to preserve the status quo, and the antagonists are people with legitimate grievances about the world and a desire to change it, and then they pull a cheap trick and have the antagonists just murder a baby or something so the audience knows that they're the bad guys. This is art produced by the rich, people who have done very well under capitalism, thank you very much, and therefore see all systemic change as inherently evil, no matter how reasonable it might seem on the surface. Next, I'd like to clarify that my criticisms of Harry Potter aren't a moral condemnation of anyone who still finds things to enjoy about the books. I've compared Harry Potter to a bunch of other stories today, and I'd like to make clear that I'm not saying Harry Potter is the wrong way to do things, and those other stories are the right way, necessarily, uh, because it's more complicated than that. In the specific instances I compared them to Harry Potter, I believe they are better, or more interesting, uh, but that obviously doesn't mean they're without problems themselves. Lord of the Rings obviously has issues with its evil fantasy races. Uh, Deep Space Nine, while excellent a lot of the time, has also broadcast some of the worst episodes of television ever created. Uh, and the Discworld novel Snuff has its own problems. Now, I'd argue it is to a degree aware of some of its problems and does investigate them in the text, but at the end of the day, it still is a story about a powerful white guy turning up and solving a bunch of other people's problems. Now, while that's still very much more satisfying to read than Harry Potter's complete refusal to engage with his society's problems, that's not a trope that is without its harmful aspects. We have had a lot of those stories, haven't we? So yes, if you still like Harry Potter, don't worry, I'm not saying you're a Slytherin. Thanks a lot for watching today, folks, and thank you especially to my supporters over on Patreon, some of whom should be scrolling by right now. Patreon backers get early access to all of my videos, so if you'd like more videos like this one, and also early access to those videos, please check out the Patreon link below. Right, that's all from me today, folks. I'll see you next time.